Phineas P. Gage, born in July of 1823 and deceased in May 1860. In the mid-19th century, Gage was the foreman of a blasting crew working on a railroad near the town of Cavendish, Vermont. In the 19th century, railroads often blast tunnels through rock by using gunpowder. They would drill a hole into the rock, fill it with gunpowder, add sand on top, and pack it in with a tamping iron. They would then light the fuse and run away to safety. On September 13th, 1848, Phineas Gage was preparing for a blast when a spark caused a premature explosion. The tamping iron impaled Gage's skull, entering below his left eye and exiting the top of his cranium. Gage was a 25-year-old man, 5 foot 6 and athletic. His movements swift and precise. His bosses say he was the most efficient and capable man in their employ. All were surprised Gage was not killed instantly. He began to speak only moments after the blast. His men carried him to the road and set him into an ox cart. Gage rode, sitting fully erect three quarters of a mile to the hotel of Mr. Joseph Adams. Gage got out of the cart himself with little help from his men. Dr. John Harlow, a town physician, was on his way, and his colleague, Dr. Edward Williams, arrived first. Dr. Williams described the scene. He, at that time, was sitting in a chair upon the piazza of Mr. Adams' hotel in Cavendish. When I drove up, he said, Doctor, here is business enough for you. I first noticed the wound upon the head before I alighted from my carriage, pulsations of the brain being very distinct. There was also an appearance which, before I examined the head, I could not account for. The top of the head appeared somewhat like an inverted funnel. This was owing, I discovered, to the bone being fractured about the opening for a distance of about two inches in every direction. The edges of this opening were everted and the whole wound appeared as if some wedge-shaped body had passed from below upward. Mr. Gage, during the time I was examining this wound, was relating the manner in which he was injured to the bystanders. He talked so rationally and was so willing to answer questions that I directed my inquiries to him in preference to the men who were with him at the time of the accident and who were standing about at this time. Mr. Gage then related to me some of the circumstances as he has since done, and I can safely say that neither at that time nor on any subsequent occasion save once did I consider him to be other than perfectly rational. The one time to which I allude was about a fortnight after the accident, and then he persisted in calling me John Kerwin, yet he answered all my questions correctly. Apart from the loss of vision in his left eye, Gage's personality changed dramatically, as Dr. Harlow states. The equilibrium or balance, so to speak, between his intellectual faculty and animal propens propensities had been destroyed. The changes became apparent as soon as the acute phase of brain injury subsided. He was now fitful, irreverent, indulging at times in the grossest profanity which was not previously his custom, manifesting but little deference for his fellows, impatient of restraint or advice when it conflicts with his desires, at times pertinaciously obstinate, yet capricious and vacillating, devising many plans of future operations which are no sooner arranged than they are abandoned, a child in his intellectual capacity and manifestations. He has the animal passions of a strong man. This was in contrast to how he had been prior to the accident. With his temperate habits, and considerable energy of character. He had a well-balanced mind and was looked upon by those who knew him 
as a shrewd, smart businessman, very energetic and persistent in executing all his plans of action. Gates went on to work on horse farms, but that did not last. He spent some time as a circus attraction at Barnum's Museum in New York City, showing off his wounds in the tamping iron with vain glory. Later, Gage moved to South America. By 1859, his health was deteriorating, and in 1860, Gage returned to San Francisco, but continued to go from job to job. Gage likely developed epileptic fits, and after a series of convulsions, died in May of 1860. They say that Phineas P. Gage was buried with the tamping iron.